Okay, um, let's just start. Hello, everyone. Thank you again for uh, coming to the machine learning launch seminar. Uh, today, we have a very exciting talk by uh, Professor Hamed Pirsiavash. Uh, Hamed is an associate professor at the University of California, Davis. And uh, prior to that, he was an associate professor at the University of Maryland at Baltimore County and a postdoctoral research associate at MIT. He obtained his PhD at the University of California, Irvine, and uh, his research is at the intersection of computer vision and machine learning with a specific interest in uh, self-supervised representation learning and adversarial robustness of deep models. I really enjoy uh, interacting with Hamed. I've learned a lot from him and I really enjoy reading his papers. And I hope that you all enjoy this uh, as well. Uh, Hamed, the stage is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction. And thanks for having me here. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, let me share my screen. Yeah, again, please stop me anytime if you have questions. And do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, awesome. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me here. So I'm gonna talk about self-supervised learning for visual recognition. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure most of you folks are familiar with uh, supervised learning or in general deep learning. So the idea is you have a bunch of images, like, well, I'm mainly working on images or visual recognition, but similar ideas could be applied to other domains as well. So I'm gonna draw a lot of examples from images because that's my main research area. So given an image and a deep model, what we want is uh, we want to basically, we, we wanna train the model so that it predicts a particular uh, output label. Like when in this case, it's an image, and the output is a vector of length 1000 and one that each dimension corresponds to one category, like in this case, the dog. So we're gonna train the model or tune the parameters of this model, which in this case is AlexNet, to given this image, produce one at dimension number two, which corresponds to dog and zero everywhere else. So that is called supervised learning because in the training, we, uh, we already know that this is an image of a dog and we are actually designing a loss in the end that is favoring this particular output. Uh, like if I give, uh, let me see if I can move this. I'm gonna move this up. Okay, so I'm given another image like uh, a chair, then probably we want the model to predict a chair, which is the first dimension. So tuning these parameters is called supervised learning. And eventually what happens is that if you do that on a reasonably large data set, uh, then eventually you can, we, we, we realize that the features that this model has learned, like the early layers of the neural network, are actually good visual recognitions in general, which means you can grab this part of the network and then transfer that into another task. And that task actually, those features are performing really well on those tasks. By transferring, I mean either fine tuning the model, like changing the, very, the parameters a little bit, or actually just training a classifier on the top of the model for the new task. Like the new task can be anything that deals with images, like maybe object detection, um, action recognition or uh, any, any other task that it deals with images, like image segmentation. Maybe. So what is wrong with su supervised learning? Well, supervised learning is very popular, but there are a few reasons that probably is not the best way of doing that. And if we can uh, get, get away from supervised learning, we're gonna benefit. One of them is getting the annotation is costly. Well, for images, that's easy, but for medical image, for instance, in medical imaging domain, it's actually very costly, right? You have to have somebody as an expert to annotate your data. And uh, the second one is it can be ambiguous, which means the labels are not always very obvious. Like, what should I call this? Should I call this like a truck or should I call this a vehicle? So the amb ambiguity of the labels is actually one more thing that is making the annotation difficult. Uh, or the annotation can be biased because obviously it is provided by some humans and humans can be biased, we know that. So. Of course, in some applications, there are privacy concerns uh, because like particularly like in medical imaging data, you don't want to share the medical data with somebody to annotate it. So that's why privacy is another issue. And probably the most important one is in general, when you limit your label space to some categories, it's a huge limit in the features that you're learning. So for instance, um, if I train a model to be coarse grain, like uh, call all possible dogs, just the dog category, in that case, the features may not be really transferable or will not be well, trans like easily transferable to other tasks that we wanna do, uh, detect this different fine grain categories of dogs, like maybe 100 different types of dogs. So 
that limitation is important because in annotation, you're limiting your features so that they can actually clamp all, like basically they have to put all images of the doc category into one category. So they should be close to each other in the feature space, but in some tasks in the future, we don't like that, right? Like again, going from coarse grain to fine grain classification. Any questions so far? I guess uh, not. No, we are good. Okay, yep, thanks. You're good. So recently, like in the past few years, there are some new algorithms called self-supervised learning. And the idea is very simple. The idea is to come up with a pseudo task for which uh, that's not the main goal of the learning, but the pseudo task is there to just, so pseudo task is a task that you provide some inputs and the output is automatic, which means the output for the task is not manual, it's automatic. And then we design the task in a way that if you force the model to solve the task, then probably in the end, uh, the model is gonna learn some features which are useful for a general visual recognition task. For instance, in this case, this is probably the most intuitive one that you have an input image, which is just a grayscale image. And well, sorry, the input image was actually colored. We changed the colored image to be a grayscale image. And then uh, we input that to the model and we force the model so that for each pixel, it can predict the color. Since we already know the color, we don't need to do the annotation. And that's already uh, provided by uh, the original input. So by doing that, when well, one goal can be colorization, that itself is an interesting task. But here the goal is not colorization. The goal is to um, the goal is to use colorization to learn good features. For instance, the idea is if we force the model to color this pixel as green, then probably the model is gonna learn some detectors that are tuned for uh, well. Those detectors are gonna detect the grass, so that anytime time that detect the grass, they're gonna color the green. The model doesn't have any idea what the grass is, or doesn't have any idea about. Uh, language or English because we have not provided any annotations like that. But eventually those kind of features that the model has developed internally are gonna be useful and we can fine tune them for future tasks. Uh, any other question, any question before I continue? So just one minute. Yeah, sorry for that. So, um, uh, maybe yeah. a question here, Hamed. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. So, this task, this um, pseudo task that we are talking about, or the proxy task that we are talking about, it's uh, ambiguous, right? Um, and so, this ambiguity is not a hindering uh, a property. Uh, like, it, it's it's not a hindering uh, characteristic right now, right? Uh, so the network is able to still learn uh, to, to turn uh, grass into green, uh, while some grass might be yellow if the picture is taken in, in, in fall. Yeah, that's a very good point, exactly. That's why this particular task is not learning very good features because of the ambiguity. Like there is no unique solution for the task. Uh, so that's why we are more interested in designing tasks for which we have a unique solution. Like we can reduce the ambiguity and make the task easier. But again, making the task easier is not the goal because we want the task to we want the task to be designed in a way that if the model solve the task, the model learns something about high level understanding of the visual recognition. But yeah, you're exactly right. That's why actually, if you look at the numbers or evaluation metrics for these kind of features that we learn from colorization, they are not under they are not the best numbers. Like they are not performing that well. And this was one of the earliest works in 2016. Actually, there were two papers at the same time in ECCB 2016 that proposed this algorithm. Well, propose this to the task. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so, so how we can evaluate self-supervised learning? Then what we can do is we have a bunch of images here. We train the self-supervised learning using some pseudo task, like colorization in this case. And then uh, we can transfer that model into another model. Basically, we can just copy the early weights here and then have another classifier on the top of that. So that given a new data set, which is labeled and a different task, which is target task, like action, action recognition or whatever, then probably we can fine tune the whole model or we can just tune the last layers 
this classifier so that it can solve the task. So this is in comparison to initializing this model for this label data set from scratch, which means from random weights. It is shown that if you start from random weights, then probably the model is not gonna perform that well, particularly if the label data set is small because the model can easily overfit. So basically this is the way that we are evaluating quantitatively how well the features are by uh, training the features this way and transferring them into another task. So there's a lot of work recently on this topic. Uh, and something that's interesting is that people have shown in many papers that if you compare self-supervised learning, and I'm gonna call it SSL from now on, SSL means self-supervised learning in this talk. So if you compare SSL with supervised setting, we're gonna, we see that actually SSL benefits more from deeper models. In this case, the green one is the supervised setting and the blue one is the SSL. So you see that as you get deeper and deeper, the gap is actually shrinking. So, uh, and interestingly, SSL can even benefit more because the size of the labeled data is usually smaller than size of unlabeled data. Like probably here you can annotate like millions of images. But if you want to use unlabeled data, you can you can actually utilize like billions of images, right? A lot of, like factors of magnitude larger uh, data set, which because unlabeled data is available abundantly for free. So, so since the literature, so one thing that is usually assumed in the literature, in my view, which is not necessarily the best idea, is that any SSL paper that is pub, any SSL algorithm that people work on, they assume that a single network architecture is there throughout the whole learning process, which means they start with some architecture like less than 50, and then they train the model all the way from beginning using less than 50. But in practice, if you really want to train good features for less than 50, what you're suggesting here is that maybe we can train a deeper model like a teacher model and then compress that into a smaller one. So by doing that, basically what you're doing is, um, we are getting actually a better performance because the red one is the R performance, which is uh, training a deeper model and then compressing that in the smaller one. Basically, in this case, we are compressing the representations from a deeper model to a smaller one. And this paper is published in NeurIPS 20. So I'm gonna um, continue this slide. Uh, sorry, sorry for interrupting, uh, Hamed. So I have a question, a clarification a question here. So uh, the deeper model is going to uh, train, the deeper model trained with SSL is going to perform better. Okay, so then uh, the idea that you're proposing is we train a very deep model that we know that is going to perform really well with SSL. And then if you want a smaller model, we are going to compress it to something smaller. Is that the idea? Exactly, like if you wanna train, exactly. If you wanna train a good representation for resident 50, right? Maybe instead of training SSL on resident 50, you can train an SSL in a much bigger data set, like resident 50 times, much bigger architecture, like resident 50 times four, and then compress that into resident 50. Got it. Right. So Thank actually you. here we showed, yeah, thanks. And here we showed that for AlexNet, for instance, which is a reasonably small model, if you train supervised, you're going to get this green one. If you train completely SSL using AlexNet, you're going to get this guy, which is almost 46%. But if you train ResNet 50 using one algorithm, like SSL algorithm, off the shelf algorithm, and then compress that into AlexNet, you're going to get even actually interestingly, it's going to be even outperforming the supervised setting, which is a few percent better than supervised, which means it's beneficial to, it's actually better to train the deeper model and then compress the representations into a smaller one. So, any other question before I continue? So then uh, the method is actually very simple. So let's actually uh, first, the red here is the encoder, which is a teacher one, which is usually a deeper model. And the, the student is actually a smaller one, like in this case, the AlexNet, and the teacher is less than 50 times four. So if the teacher was a supervised model with categorical output, like dog, chair, uh, car, and so on, what we could do is, which is actually popular, which is called model distillation, is we can train the student so that it can mimic the output of the of output of the teacher using something like a KL divergence loss, which is basically just comparing the probability distribution at the output of the teacher, comparing that with the output of the student. By minimizing the scale divergence loss, what happens is the output of the student is gonna look like the output of the teacher. So this is very well known, which was introduced in 2015 by Jeff Hinton and the lab. But the problem is in SSL, we don't have categorical output. What we have is a bunch of embeddings, right? Remember that we didn't look, so we use only the features that the model has learned. 
And the actual task itself is not actually like colorization is not our main interest. So if you change the output of the teacher to be from to be uh, non-categorical, then probably KL divergence is not useful. But what we can do is mean squared loss, which means just calculate including distance between these two and minimize that. However, this doesn't perform well. So in uh, an older work that we published in CVPR 18, what we did was one solution for this that we said, instead of doing MSE, let's actually cluster the output of the teacher into different clusters and then assign each output, each image, basically your input, unlabeled input into one of the clusters. And now let's train the student so that it can predict the cluster. So in this case, we can use the standard cross entropy loss. Basically, we use cross entropy loss when the images are labeled, but in this case, instead of the labels, we're going to use the ident ID of the cluster. So that performed better than MSE loss. And recently, we have actually even better model that I'm going to discuss now that does this form of distillation. So any question before I continue? No. OK. So yeah. Um, what we do here is we are saying, and remember that we didn't have any category in the output, right? That's why we couldn't do KL divergence or some form of probability distribution comparison. But what we can do is instead of comparing, um, instead of comparing the categorical output, we can compare the neighborhood similarity. What we can do is given a query image, which is the brown one, we can compare that query image with a bunch of random images, like these are random images. And then we can get the similarity and using something like a softmax, we can convert that into probability distribution. So a higher value here basically means the query is more similar to that particular anchor point in this case. Or these are just a bunch of random images, embeddings of random images. But for instance, we can, we can call them anchor points. So in this case, number one is a high probability. That means the query is closer to one. Or three is the highest one, which means query is very close to the three. But two is actually very far away. Okay. So this probability distribution somehow captures the similarity between the query and a bunch of random anchor points. We can do exactly the same thing for the student, right? We're gonna get a different probability distribution probably. And then what we can do is we can make sure, we can encourage the, or train the student so that the similarity in the neighborhood of the query is similar for, between the teacher and the student. And that is very easy because we have two probability distributions. Now we can just uh, compare them using KL divergence. And then we can freeze the teacher and tune the student so that the KL divergence is minimized. That means if you train well, eventually the student is going to produce a bunch of embeddings for images that the neighborhood of those embeddings are similar to the neighborhoods in the teacher space. Any question? Um, exactly. So there is a question in the chat that I had the same question. How are the anchor points selected? You mentioned that they are random. But uh, it seems like they are actually going to be important for the algorithm. Um, yeah, yeah. So ideally, you want to use all your data set as like, like if you have n number of data points, one of them should be query and everything else should be uh, anchor points, right? Like n minus one. But doing that is going to be expensive because each time you have to calculate all those embeddings. So you can't do that. So that's why what we do is just we use a bunch of random anchor points and each iteration we change the randomness. So basically out of n minus one data points that could be anchor points, n is the size of data set, one is the query and n minus one can be anchor points. We just choose maybe 100 of them randomly, right? So that's one way of doing that. But unfortunately, since that 100 is gonna be small, what we do is we use something called memory bank that we keep track of a bunch of those uh, anchor points and we compare with all of them at once. So basically throughout the previous iterations, we collect all these anchor points and we assume that the model is constant which is not exactly correct because this model is actually moving. But even with the assumption that the model is constant, we can actually put together a memory bank and we can keep track of a bunch of random anchor points. But that random anchor points are gonna change over time. Did you and, answer uh, uh, yeah, uh, fantastic. So the idea of prototypes also is relevant. I mean, they are not random, but like what will happen if we actually choose prototypes, uh, like a large number of fixed prototypes? Uh, have you I, guys looked into that? You could do that. You mean by prototypes, you mean uh, non-images, but in prototypical networks, that's supervised setting, right? So each prototype corresponds to one category. Is that what you mean? 
Great, but uh, in the previous slide, the previous approach that you had, you use clustering. So uh -huh. I'm uh, imagining that if we just do this clustering and maybe have uh -huh. over clustering, the centroids yeah. could be defined as like pseudo uh, prototypes and the same, same thing can be carried out. Yeah, that is true. That is exactly right. We could do that. But the problem is that the structure within each category is going to be uh, gone, right? You can't really make any, 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 you can't make the student to produce the same structure within each category. So by doing this, what we are doing is that suppose you have, like in the experiments that we did here, we had like 1000 clusters. So in that case, we are forcing the student to predict the same cluster. But the problem is the clustering might get wrong, might get correct. But eventually, the features that you're learning within each cluster might be different from the student, from the teacher, right? Like two images might be closer in the uh, teacher space within a cluster, but might be far away in the student's right. space in that cluster. So, but yeah, you can do over clustering, but that's one way of doing that. But uh, if you do increase the size of clusters to be the size of the data set, basically in that case, each data point is one cluster, right? So these are two ends of the same spectrum. Got it. Yep. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, any other question before I continue? Okay, so yeah, that's pretty much it. Then. Basically, the P that I have here is uh, e to the power of uh, the dot product between these two and normalized by all data points. And then eventually we calculate the KL divergence between a P of the teacher and P of the student. And we do sum that over all data points. And that is going to be the main loss eventually that we are minimizing. Okay, so if you do this and if we evaluate this, it's actually very interesting that in evaluation, we use three different evaluations, like linear evaluation is very popular, which is exactly similar to what I discussed here, that you basically um, train this model and eventually you have just the linear layer on the top of this deep model so that it can tune the, like tuning this linear classifier is gonna basically solve the task for you. That basically somehow evaluates how how if if the categories of this task are linearly separated on the features that you have learned here. If your features are really good, we expect the categories to be linearly separable. That's why we just evaluate that using a linear layer. That's one evaluation which is very popular in the community. We actually do that evaluation and we see that again, I showed this that actually on uh, shallower models, our method, obviously because it's using a deeper SSL model, our method performs better than even the supervised setting. So we have two other evaluations, which are in my view interesting. One of them is just nearest neighbor search, which is just very simple. And the idea here is that linear evaluation has some hyperparameters and it takes time to train that linear classifier because you do gradient descent on it. But maybe a better way of doing that is to just do near, nearest neighbor. This is actually super fast and it doesn't have any parameters. This is just one nearest neighbor. It doesn't have any hyperparameter. So it's very reproducible. It's very easy to calculate and easy to actually benchmark algorithms based on. Another one is cluster alignment that again, I'm excited about, which is, well, which is not our work actually. It was introduced earlier with some other folks, but uh, I'm, it's not very well adopted in this community, but I believe it should. So the idea is you cluster your features. Suppose you have ImageNet. Well, these are all basically ImageNet classification, by the way, I forgot to mention. So these categories are, which are ImageNet, which is 1.2 million images and 1,000 categories. So 60% means 60% of the images are classified correctly. Uh, so in cluster alignment, what we do is we, um, pass all the ImageNet images through the model, we get the embeddings, we run k-means on them with 1,000 categories, with 1,000 k equal to 1,000. So we get 1,000 different clusters. And now using something like bipartite matching, we match each cluster into one of the actual categories because the images have labels, right? So after matching, then we evaluate the model. So obviously the evaluation here is much lower than here because a lot of them are gonna be wrong. But again, you see that here, uh, the same trend holds, that supervised setting is usually better than unsupervised and self-supervised setting. And if you do this kind of compression, you can actually get a uh, better performance compared to SSL itself. Yeah. Any question before I continue? So I believe these two evaluations are very suitable for evaluation of SSL because they are pretty fast and they don't have much many hyperparameters. Like this one doesn't have any hyperparameter and this one also almost it doesn't have any hyperparameter. And it's actually pretty fast. This is just one k-means and like Hungarian algorithm. 
but this one actually takes a long time. It depends on what's the learning rate, how many epochs you do, and so on. There are actually recent papers that show that if you do linear evaluation enough, you're going to actually see that the trend that we used to see before between among SSL algorithms does not hold anymore. So that's why linear evaluation is not the best evaluation for benchmarking, probably. So if we do um, clustering, like remember that is talked about cluster alignment. So here actually I'm just showing a bunch of images from the clustering. Each row is one cluster. And you see that each, like we have, we are showing like 10 images from each cluster. And all images here are randomly chosen. Like the clusters are randomly chosen and the images between them, among them are also randomly chosen. So there is no cherry picking, there is no human involvement in producing this graph. And you see that actually uh, each row corresponds to somehow similar categories. And remember that in order to get this kind of clustering, we have done no, we have used no human label, no manual labels. Even though we don't have any manual labels, but you see that actually there is a lot of semantic coherency among these categories, among these clusters. Uh, Hamed, I have one quick question here. What SSL algorithm was used to generate these? Um... Yeah, that's a very good point. So this model that I showed here was uh, ImageNet model, AlexNet model, sorry. The final model is AlexNet architecture. And the SSL model that we use is off the shelf. And that is a Simclair that is trained on ResNet 50 times 4. SimCLR is a particular algorithm that is trained on ResNet 50 times 4. We use that one as a teacher, and we distill that into AlexNet. And the results that I just show are this point, which is uh, AlexNet architecture distilled from ResNet 50 times 4 using SimClear. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. So in terms of numbers, if I want to show that, like supervised and ImageNet again is 56%. This is basically the graph that I show in the table. And actually, we get 59%, which is slightly better. And the colorization that we discussed earlier, that actually uh, you were mentioning that probably is not very powerful. That's actually, you see that it's kind of in this table at least. Well, there are some other algorithms as well, but at least on this table, this is 31%, which is almost uh, the smallest one in this table. And there are quite a few other algorithms that are introduced in recent years, and I'm actually comparing with them. So this is a training on image, fine tuning on ImageNet as a linear classifier. And this one is fine tuning on a different data set, which is places as a linear classifier. So, well, what we can do is we can actually, well, so far what we did, we just reduced the size of the model. But what we can do is we can reduce the precision of the model, for instance. Like in this case, we can train the model using ResNet 50 and floating point. That's going to be 70.8. And then we can distill that into ResNet 18 with binary and neurons and activations, like binary weights and binary activations of the network. So you see that actually we go from 70.8 to almost 50%. But interestingly, if you want to train a SSL algorithm like MoCo on ResNet 18, but floating point, you're going to actually get worse performance. Even though our algorithm is producing a binary activation and binary weights, which is much cheaper to run at the inference time, it's actually slightly better than the counterpart, which is trained using a standard SSL algorithms using a floating point operation. And if you wanted to supervise just for comparison, it's actually better. Like in the binary setting, ResNet 18 binary supervised gets 57%, which is better than 51% that you're getting. But this is, this is just another angle of what I showed here, that so far I talked about reducing the size of the model, but here I'm talking about reducing the precision of the model. And of course, the size together, like we are doing ResNet 50 to ResNet 80. Any question before I switch the gears? I'm going to talk about a different algorithm that is along the same lines. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk about the next topic. Well, so far I talked about SSL by compressing representations. Now I'm going to talk about all negatives are not equally negative in contrastive learning and what I mean by that. So the recent SSL is actually, uh, is very simple actually. Most of the recent SSL algorithms, like Simclair that I talked about or MoCo, they are actually all using somehow the same inductive bias. And the idea is this. We have a query image. We augment it twice. And we say that we pass each of them through the model, which is just shared. And we get two embeddings. And we are saying that since we know that these two images are the same, probably their embeddings should be close to each other. Then we just pull these two embeddings to be close to each other. But obviously, this can result in some trivial solution, like all the embeddings can become zero. So what people do is, in a particular algorithm called uh, MoCo, 
what people do is what we do is we choose random images. And we say not only these two embeddings should be close to each other, but they should be far from a bunch of random images also. Okay, that means two embeddings of the same image should be closer to each other compared to two embeddings of different images. Okay, so and if you use a memory bank to increase the number of negatives, that basically becomes an algorithm which is very well known called MoCo, momentum contrast learning. So that was introduced in. I guess CVPR 20, but I'm not sure. Yeah, CVPR 20, sorry. Yeah. So our idea here is that we have a binary distinction between the positives and negatives. Basically for this query image, we have one positive image and we have a bunch of negative images. But the distinction between them is basically just binary. This one is positive one, these are all negative one. It's just a categorization, right? But the problem is if you look at the visualizations, in this case, I'm showing two augmentations of the same image. Right. By augmentation, I mean shifting, changing the color, rotation, flipping, and so on. And if I rank the negative images with their similarity to the query and rank them this way, like left to right means the ranking, like rank one is the closest one, you see that actually quite a few of them are very close to the query image itself. And in MoCo, which is this algorithm, we are saying this is the query. This one has the label equal to one because this should be close to this. And all these ones have the label equal to zero because they should be far from this. Right, this is a labeling. But this is misleading because a bunch of these negative images are very close to the positive one. So maybe it's not the best way of uh, super was learning or designing the loss. What we do is we say, let's come up with the similarity between them. And we basically use a similarity as a label, as a regression task. In this case, the similarity between this image and this image is much higher compared to this image and this image. And the same thing for all of them. So you see that the MoCo is a binary task, but in IST, which is iterative similarity distillation, in this case, we just calculate the similarity and use that one as the label. Is it clear? Or any question? Uh, I guess one question here would be at what uh, point in training mm -hmm. uh, do you turn the similarity on? Because um, if you think about the dynamics of training in the beginning, your similarities are not going to potentially be meaningful at all. Yeah, that's a very good point. So the idea is actually slightly different. So let me actually just describe that here then. We have a teacher model. That's a very good question actually, that guides me to this slide. So we have the teacher model again. This is somewhat similar to our compressed algorithm that we distill the similarities. But remember in compressed algorithm, we had a teacher that was already pre-trained. So it had very good representations. And then we just distill that into our student. But in this case, we don't have a pre-trained teacher. So what we do is we assume the teacher is the running average of the student, which is initially the teacher and student are the same. But as it goes, the student is being trained and tuned using this algorithm. And the teacher is the average over all previous students, right, over time. So we know that usually ensembling works well, which means if you have a bunch of different students, if you average them, that is gonna be better than each of those students in general, right? Like wisdom of crowd. So what happens here is somehow the same, the same idea that the student is gonna be slightly worse than the teacher. So like the teacher is gonna be slightly better than the student because that's average of multiple students. And by using the similarity from the student and enforcing the, uh, from the teacher, and enforcing the student to follow the same similarity, we are basically saying that the recent student should be as good as the average of all previous students, right? So that is the main idea here. Let me just, basically the idea is this one, that again, we have two augmentations and we have a bunch of random images as anchors, similar to the compressed idea. But in this case, the teacher is not a frozen. Uh, we run the images through the teacher, we calculate the similarities in similar way. We get the probability distribution. We run the same images and same anchor points through the student. We get similarity and probability distribution. We minimize the KL divergence. When we minimize it, we do the uh, gradient descent through the student model. So we tune the student parameters. And as soon as the student is updated in this iteration, we're gonna add it to the previous teacher. Basically, we're gonna make sure that the teacher is average of the previous students. And that's why the teacher is gonna be slightly better. So somehow the same thing happens in MoCo and a bunch of other algorithms as well. Let me just show what happens here actually. So here I have two graphs. The blue one is the teacher and the uh, other color, like the red color, orange color is the student. So you see that throughout the epochs, 
Uh, initially, they are the same, but throughout epochs, the teacher is slightly better than the student. And eventually, when the learning rate goes down, we actually see that they converge again. So since here, usually the teacher is better than the student, the teacher is trying to pull up the student and make it better. Okay. And the same thing actually happens. Interestingly, we figured out that the same thing happens with other algorithms as well. Like even in MoCo, because in MoCo also we have the teacher and the student, the same thing happens here also. And another one, which is again, another interest, important algorithm called BYUL, the same thing happens here. Like the teacher is usually better than the student, slightly better than the student. And we are not sure why exactly, we hypothesize the reason for the teacher to be better than the student is that that is kind of ensemble of a bunch of students. That's just a hypothesis. But to get back to your point is that, yeah, we don't have a good teacher. We don't have a pre-trained model. Like initially, they're all bad. But as time goes on, the teacher is going to be slightly better than the student. That's why it can guide the student. So if we do that, I, I don't want to bore you with the numbers, but Obviously, we get good numbers on this one. This is actually published in ICCV 2021. Uh, this is called Integrative Similarity Distillation, ISD. So yeah, any question before I continue? Uh, more of a clarification than a uh, question, Hamed. So mm -hmm. is it fair to say that ISD uh, reduces the noise of the negatives? So in uh, uh, like when we talked about these negatives, like there are a lot of negatives that actually should be positives. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that we are going to identify these and uh, weight them accordingly. So they are going to be less negative than, than the other negatives that must be. So it re we reduce the amount of signal that's uh, the noise in the negatives essentially. Yeah, 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 that's a very good way of saying that exactly. So you are saying that a bunch of these negatives are not supposed to be negative. They are actually wrong and we are actually removing them. One way of doing that is to remove those negatives and just not consider them, right? Yeah. But the problem is, again, that's kind of a binary. But there is other stuff that are shown earlier that um, like it's called network refinery. That was a paper a long time ago, like a few years ago. And the idea is if you want to do distillation, it's actually a good idea to do distillation using soft labels rather than hard labels. So when you do the soft labels, you have much more information that is going from teacher to the student. So that is something similar here, that instead of just removing these closer images, we just say that let's actually do distillation using soft labels rather than the hard labels. Like MoCo has this hard labeling one and zero, but we do the soft labeling. And usually soft labeling in installation performs better in supervised setting as well. Great, fantastic. Yeah, this is, this is a great idea. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Any other question before I continue? I'm gonna switch the gears slightly. Uh, there is one more question. Yeah, please. Uh, so uh, Lance asked, BYOL seems not to use, uh, mm -hmm. BYOL seems not to use oh, BYOL. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, seems not to use uh, negative samples. Yes. And, and what's the question? Yeah, uh, so, uh, but uh, BYOL use latent representation. So it seems like the problem comes from the negative samples. So can, can we use something like similar to BYOL, like using the, uh, latent represent, representation instead of using negative samples so that it can remove the need of these uh, negative samples selection kind of. Oh, yes, yes, you can use BYUL definitely. But actually, I'm actually comparing with BYUL here also. You see that actually our model performs slightly better than BYUL in linear, but the nearest neighbor and other 20 nearest neighbor we are performing BYUL. But yeah, so there is actually an advantage of MoCo in general to BYUL because in BYUL, you're just saying that, actually I have a slide here for people. Uh, one minute. So this was MoCo, right? This is the binary one and BYUL is this guy. BYUL basically just says that forget about the negatives, just push these two to be close to each other. Of course, they are actually having some little model, little projection layer here as well. Like they are predicting the output of this guy, but eventually they just say that actually, even if you pull these two together, that is not gonna result in trivial solution. It's not very obvious why it doesn't result in trivial solution, but in a lot of experiments, people have shown that it doesn't and it performs really well. But the, the one problem here is this, that when you do BYUL, you're just saying that these two should be close to each other, but in the feature space, closeness in different directions might have different meanings, right? So in MoCo, that's actually captured well because it said it should be closer compared to a bunch of negative examples. So that is probably one of the reasons that ISD might perform better than BYUL but I'm not really sure why exactly. That's just a hypothesis. That instead of saying that it is just close to each other, we are saying that it's close to each other in a different directions differently. Like 
it's better to be close to each other and be far away from the negative steps rather than just being close to each other. Did you answer your question? Okay. Yeah, so, so basically you are saying using negative samples, it's more clear of the definition of which direction we want, we want to go. Right? Yeah, yeah, okay. uh, that's my hypothesis, yes. I'm not sure if it's true again, this is just a hypothesis. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, sure, thank you. So going back, yeah, so we talked about these two and now I'm gonna talk about another. So these are actually pretty, so you see that actually this idea ISD was somehow very similar to the compressor. Right? We used almost the same loss. But instead of actually doing that, just using frozen teachers, we did that iteratively. So um, another thing that I'm gonna talk about briefly is mean shift idea. So there are two different types of SSL algorithms. One of them is classic clustering, which is just do k-means, but have a deep network in between. Basically uh, cluster the results of deep network and then train the model to uh, predict the clustering. That's one form of doing uh, SSL. Another form is actually MoCo that we just discussed about or BYUL that again, we just discussed about, right? So there are two different forms. So what we did, we said, let's actually combine these somehow. Like in BYUL, what happens is you have this query image and you pull it to be closer to uh, its own augmentation. So these two points are the two different augmentations of the same image. That's what happened in BYUL, exactly what I showed here, right? So what we said, let's actually do mean shift idea here. Like instead of saying that this guy should be close to its own augmentation, it should be not only close to its own augmentation, but also the nearest neighbors of the augmentation. So basically we are somehow grouping them together. So if you folks are familiar with mean shift algorithm, which is a different algorithm for clustering, the idea is we wanna find the mode of distribution. So we have a circle here and each time we calculate the average within the circle and move the circle towards the average. So since you are doing that, the circle is gonna be gradually moved towards the center of the uh, mass of this distribution, like basically the mode of the distribution. So that's a very classic old algorithm that we usually learn about in machine learning classes, but k-means is much more popular nowadays. So we said, let's actually use mean shift on the top of deep network so that we can get this kind of, uh, we, it, that's exactly the goal, right? We wanna learn the mode of the distribution. So uh, then what we do is exactly this one that again, very similar. We have two different augmentations of the same image. And then uh, we, we call one of them like query to the other one target. And in the target, we actually put it in a data set, the target itself. And then we search for the nearest neighbors of the target here, like maybe five nearest neighbors. Obviously the first nearest neighbor is gonna be the target itself. And there is gonna be three more, uh, like in this case is four nearest neighbors. There is gonna be one of them is itself. The other one is three more nearest neighbors. Now what we can do is we can average all these four and we can say that like, this is gonna be the center of mass of that circle. And we're gonna say, I want the query to be close to the average of them. Or in other words, I want the query to be close to all these four examples. Of course, if I do one nearest neighbor instead of four, then that's gonna be exactly be by you, right? Because this guy is gonna be here and I'm just saying that the query should be close to target. So that's exactly be by you. But as soon as I increase K to be more than one, I'm not only just pulling that image to be close to its own augmentation, I'm pulling that to be close to nearest neighbors of its augmentation as well. So this grouping is starting to happen here. Like again, this is a form of clustering, but it's implicit clustering. So that actually helps a lot in the SSL. Actually, we actually show that it's actually outperforming BYUL. But again here, MSF is a generalized case of BYUL. If you set K equal to one, that's gonna be exactly BYUL. But for larger Ks, you are actually not only forcing them, not only encouraging the same augmentations to be similar, you're also saying that an image should be closer to its own nearest neighbors, which means that the image should be moved towards the center of the mass of the distribution. The local, local center of the mass of the distribution. So again, if you compare, you're gonna see that actually, uh, the results are pretty good here again, like 72%, like ISC that I just talked about gets 69% on ImageNet using result 50. And MoCo gets 67% and MSF gets like 72%. And if you fine tune the model using a smaller data set, like 1% to 10%, then you see there actually is a huge difference. Like in supervised setting in 1%, you get 25% accuracy. But if you do MSF using a lot of like whole 100% data using unlabeled data, and then if you just use 1% of labels, you're gonna get 55% accuracy. So if you have a small data set, then probably it's a good idea to initialize the model from something like MSF or an SSL algorithm and then 
uh, tune that using the small data set. Again, this was actually published in ICCB 2021 called Mean Shift Algorithm for Self Supervised Learning. So, another thing just briefly here is that we can also do transfer learning evaluation, which means we can train the model using ImageNet. And then we can transfer that to a bunch of different algorithms, different tasks like food, like hamburger compared to like shawarma. Uh, we can do like CFAR. These are different data sets, like car data set, like aircraft data set, and so on. And we can actually show that if you do that, you're actually outperforming a supervised model. Like in this case, supervised model is getting an average throughout all the tasks. Supervised model is getting like 78% accuracy, but if you use uh, mean shift, you're getting 75% accuracy. Uh, well, this is actually using 200. There's actually some comparison here that like this one is 200 epochs, but the baseline, some of them are 1000 epochs. If you compare that with BYUL, which is the specific case, then we are actually getting 75 compared to 74, which is a slight improvement. So as I look back, I talked about uh, compressing SSL representations from deeper SSL to smaller SSLs. That's probably a better approach if you want to train either smaller SSL models or SSL models that have low precision. Uh, another one is if you want to do something similar to MoCo, which is very popular these days, it's better not to deal with that as um, binary classification. Basically, all negatives are not equally negative. Probably it's better to deal them differently using regression or distillation. Another one is mean shift is a super simple algorithm that everybody knows about, but applying that mean shift algorithm to uh, deep networks and doing SSL outperforms most of the state of the art algorithms. I would like to thank all my students and collaborators on all these works that I presented. Yeah, thanks. I'm happy to answer questions. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, Hamed. Let's uh, mm -hmm. unmute and uh, thank our speaker very fast. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, questions? And by the way, if you have a question, you can simply unmute and ask the question. Now. So there is one question uh, from Castor saying, how long did it take to run these algorithms? Yeah, so most of these algorithms run, like, let me just show you. So remember here, this is actually another point. Like a lot of people who are working on these kind of algorithms, they are running them for like 800 or 1000 epochs, which is very expensive. Since most of these methods are published by like industrial research labs because they have a lot of resources. But in university, there's actually one, one downside that in university it's difficult to run such algorithms for a long time because you don't have much of resources. So what we do is we usually run stuff into 200 epochs and believe that's important for an algorithm to perform well in less number of epochs or fewer number of epochs, because that's gonna be more useful for a broader uh, applications or audiences. So training one of these models for 200 epochs, well, they're almost all the same time. It almost takes, uh, I believe it is around five days on four GPUs, like four high-end GPUs, like 2080 Ti or something like that and almost, if you use four of them, it takes almost five or six days for 200 epochs. Of course, if you want to do 1,000 epochs, that's going to be five times longer, which is almost a month of four GPUs. Right. Uh, and that's a long time. That's it's uh, a long time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, I have one question, maybe quickly. Uh, in the mean shift algorithm, I think I believe it's the previous slide or two slides back. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, here. Uh, the, the size of the set the current target plus random targets uh, on the top left. Uh -huh. Yeah, this, the size of this set, uh, this is not, this can't be as big as the entire data set, right? Because then you're essentially doing a, a K nearest neighbor on your entire set in each step of your, um, uh, your SSL algorithm, right? In, in each oh. gradient iteration. So how, what is the effect of the size of that set? Yeah, that's a very good point, actually. So the size is important to be large, right? Because nearest neighbor usually works well when you have large uh, set of data, right? If you have a very small data set, the nearest neighbor doesn't work well. And But the problem is that if you want to process all of them at each iteration, that's going to be very time consuming and expensive. Right? So what we do again is we are using a memory bank here because uh, the target is, the again, the moving average of the encoder, right? So the target is not actually evolving very fast because we have a momentum update here. 
like each time we update the teacher the target to be the previous target plus 0 0.001 times the new student. So each time we are adding a very small portion of the new student to the teacher, right? So that's kind of, that's actually making the target to be something that is following the student or online encoder, but very slowly. And since the target is following that very slowly, it makes sense to actually uh, uh, maintain a memory bank, which means keep the embeddings of the, all the previous iterations into your memory. And when you do that, since the target is not actually evolving very fast, that memory is gonna be consistent for a long time. If you keep it for a very long time, then it's gonna be obsolete, but if it's okay to keep that for a long time. So for a reasonably long time. The, we are actually showing that in the paper, we are, I, I believe we are showing, I'm not sure about the exact numbers, but probably something around like starting from very small memory bank to almost 64,000 size memory bank, right? Mm -hmm. So the model performs, uh, improves, but after 64,000 or 128,000, I'm not sure which one, it's actually plateaus, which means if you go beyond that, the size of data is large enough, the size of memory bank is large enough that the nearest neighbor does not really benefit from. Does it, does it make sense? Yeah, yeah, got it. Yeah, thank you. And uh, the, each, each mini batch in our experiments are 256. So uh, 64K probably means, I don't know, like less than 1,000 iterations. So, like maybe 500 iterations is 128K. So if your memory bank is 128K, that means the past 500 iterations are stored in the memory bank. And that's first in, first out, which means a new mini batch that comes in, the oldest mini batch is going to be uh, dropped. Mm -hmm. okay. So those are the most recent embeddings. And since the, t the target is not evolving very fast, then probably that's consistent. Fantastic. Thanks. Any more questions? Okay, if not, we can thank uh, our speaker again. Thank you, Hamed. This was a fantastic mm -hmm. talk. Um, yeah, and thank you for agreeing to uh, give a talk in our seminar. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. I enjoyed this. Thank you. Awesome. Have a good one.